Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine and the Association of Family Medicine Residency Directors. My name is Emily Walters and I'll be facilitating today's webinar session called Upping Your Teaching Game with the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource. Our panelists today are all members of the Residency Curriculum Resource Editorial Board. We have with us Dr. Timothy Graham, Dr. Natasha Lautenschlager, and Dr. Michael Tuggy today. Dr. Tim Graham will be starting us today. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as Emily said, my name is T Tim Graham. I'm program director at uh, Mount Carmel Health System in Columbus, Ohio. And we're going to be talking about upping your teaching game with the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource. So uh, disclosure, all of us are members of the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource Editors Board, as, as was, uh, we talked about earlier. And the objectives of this session are as follows. Uh, so by the time you complete this uh, session, uh, we hope that you'll be able to understand uh, the current state of the residency curriculum resource and get an idea of how it's structured. Uh, learn how to use uh, interactive teaching tools to enhance retention and uh, promote better practical understanding of topic matters uh, pertinent to family medicine, and also learn how to implement the residency curriculum resource in a way that it can actually engage your faculty, get buy-in into the process, and make full use of the resource that you have at your disposal. So why is this important? Why is establishing an evidence-based family medicine curriculum a challenge? Um, family medicine is a broad field, we all know that. Uh, we cover everything from adult medicine, pediatric medicine, uh, animal medicine, uh, obstetrics, women's health, behavioral health, and procedures. So there's really nothing that is off limits to us uh, from a topic, uh, topic perspective. So we have a large uh, area of uh, information that comes from you. Okay, next slide. Uh, so there are other challenges in addition to the breadth of what we're actually trying to cover that make this a little bit more challenging. Faculty time is a huge issue. Um, as we all know, um, faculty, there is a faculty shortage. And many programs are looking for faculty to be able to fill the roles. And the faculty that we do have uh, have multiple responsibilities between uh, doing precepting, having uh, you know, inpatient uh, responsibilities, having um, precepting responsibilities, giving lectures, et cetera. Uh, they also have their own professional development to attend to. Um, when creating content, it's also important that they are able to review uh, the sessions that they're giving, be able to update them and make sure that the information that they are providing is actually relevant to the learners. Um, another challenge is that not all the faculty that we have within our programs may have the expertise in all the different areas to be able to cover the breadth of those myriad of topics that we talked about earlier. And also, it just takes time. It takes time to create sessions that are of high quality uh, and that are evidence-based. So how are we doing as educators? Well, the answer is kind of unclear. Uh, a study that came out by Epling in 2018 uh, said that there was a really positive environment within medical education about teaching evidence-based medicine, that oftentimes the problem ends up being the infrastructure. There isn't an established infrastructure to be able to help our faculty be able to teach that type of, that type of uh, structure. So this isn't really just uh, true of family medicine. It's actually also true of, uh, of other disciplines. It's been investigated in the emergency medicine literature. So it's not even for us. So um, Tim, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you clearly. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, if you could get a little closer. closer to the ending. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. So what can we do to actually help overcome these um, We have a number of options. One is helping uh, to really prepare our faculty for faculty development, be able to develop evidence-based curricula. Uh, we can make certain that the uh, curricula they do, that they do create and the sessions they do create are peer reviewed to make sure that they're accurate so having no person uh, kind of looking at the We can make sure that those sessions are actually also updated as we all know medicine. 
what we present to our learners and how we engage them. Uh, and another option is actually using the resources that are actually already so, so Tim, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that the sound issue is still resolved. It's kind of going in and out. Is there anything that you think might be covering up your microphone? No, no, my microphone is the same as it was. Okay, all right, just checking. Yeah. I'll try getting a little bit closer still. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a green close up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, next slide. So we're going to turn over to an audience poll question next. All right. So we did want to find out a little bit about those of you who are attending. And we wanted to go ahead and um, find out um, from you all uh, whether or not you're already using this resource. So we're going to go ahead and launch a poll. And you'll be able to see the option once I launch it um, to answer yes or no. Um, are you currently using this resource? Um, so go ahead and let us know. Are you, are you using it or not? And um, that'll kind of let us know um, how to kind of tailor this session um, to whether um, you are, are or are not. And um, either way, the session will kind of let you know techniques for using it and um, how to use it even better in your own um, practice. Okay, so we've got a lot of the audience has already voted. So we're going to, I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results with everyone. Okay. Okay, so there you go. So it looks like we've got um, about 69% who are not currently using it and 31% who are currently using it. Um, so that is um, a little bit different than I thought. I actually kind of expected a few more of you might already be using it. So that's great. We're glad to have you all here. Um, all right, so we'll go back to our slideshow and now we'll go, um, I think, over to um, Dr. Tuggy. We'll present a little bit more about the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource. Yeah, good morning and welcome, everybody. I just wanted to touch base a little bit about where this all started. You know, about uh, probably 12 years ago or so, I began presenting a, at AFMRD about the idea of having a collaborative residency project or a curriculum project. And it took a couple of years, but AFMRD and STFM leadership decided to move ahead with this project, which is a true collaboration between our two academic organizations, you know, STFM and AFMRD. And it's also brought about a collaboration among many programs because all the authors who are contributing to the, uh, the, the RCR are actually, you know, representing over 150 programs around the country. And that uh, is, has really been our largest collaboration, I think, in any efforts we've done educationally within our two organizations. Uh, next slide. And so what, this, what the resource does is it provides residency programs with access to an extensive library of peer-reviewed, evidence-based teaching tools that are ready to use with minimal need for advanced preparation. And I think this has been what Tim alluded to already that, you know, the, the time it takes to prepare content that is actually high quality is is pretty extensive. And then you look at how many topics we have to cover. Uh, you know, in our program, we calculated out about $100,000 per year of faculty time would be necessary to create and refine and re revise our teaching content on, a, on an annual basis. And of course, that is a, a budget uh, item and also a time constraint that almost none of us have any any ability to really meet that demand. So collaborating on the same resource made much more sense than trying to have every program do this on its own. Next slide. So well, we, we've organized the curriculum into uh, topic areas. And so these are typically representing uh, things or rotations that you might have resonance on or uh, portions of rotation. So for instance, we have we have a section on cardiovascular medicine, and that could be used on your cardiology rotation, but also would be part of your inpatient service rotation as well. And you know, each of these topic areas then has core topics underneath it. And the core topics represent the, the things that, that our editorial board, along with looking at many other residency curricula, have decided were, would, would be the core essentials. And these are also tagged very closely to the AFP uh, journal articles that are available and also the AAFP curriculum guidelines. Next slide. 
So for each module, each topic uh, that is completed, we have several different tools. The first tool is a PowerPoint presentation. And these are not your typical PowerPoint presentations of 45 slides with lots of text on them. I mean, the, the, the only reason why we're using PowerPoint is to help guide your, your interactive teaching methods throughout the, the, um, the session you have with your residents. And the PowerPoint slides are designed to be modified so you can actually make your own adjustments to them as you see fit for the content you would like to add to the presentation and also the the content of the slides is is meant to be one that you use for interactive uh, questions and engaging your audience in an active learning processes next slide we start out with each section each category each topic has a set of required readings which we are on a, we routinely updating to try to get the most recent uh, articles and we use the AFP journal a lot because the articles are excellent and evidence-based and uh, are updated on a, on a regular cycle um, and we also try to find other unrestricted readings that we that you can use that would be that we find to be particularly useful for a content area next slide uh, the, the key piece that's actually available in each module is the facilitator's guide and this is where your faculty uh, will save a ton of time in that they have the content provided in the PowerPoint deck, but then they also have a handout for them to go through of how to present the material and what are the key learning points, what are the key objectives that you're trying to, to promote, and the key points that you may want to reinforce with every slide that's in the deck. And so that uh, facilitator's guide is a major part of, of the content that will help your faculty teach the session well and make sure the key points are taught to the residents. And then finally, there's a pre and post test uh, that can be used either way. Uh, you know, faculty will choose to use this sometimes as a pre-test after the residents have done the reading. Uh, you can also use it as a post test to see uh, what it is that they've learned during the session and also to make sure that they're getting the key points. So we've asked our authors to create post or these, these quiz questions based on the key learning points of management for the session that's being, or for the topic that's being covered. So that, uh, that test can be useful for pre and post assessment. Next slide. And then finally, within some modules, some of the modules actually have worksheets and other tools. Um, and we'll, sh Emily, if you could just tap the space bar to let you move forward. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's case study handouts, there's other types of tools that are provided within the uh, materials so that your residents have things to work on. And I think one of the things that you can also add is if you're building your own cases, you can insert those into a module yourself as a faculty person, with a, if, you have, if you have a great case that matches with the topic that you're teaching, uh, and you can add those in on your own. And we are looking at different ways that we can expand our own uh, topic areas by, and we'll talk about this briefly a little later, about the just-in-time topics that we're working on now as a new addition that can help add um, more content to the current offerings that we have in our topic areas. So the final thing I just wanted to mention was this whole idea of active teaching methods, and I'll touch on this a little bit more later on. But the modules are really uh, designed to incorporate active learning. And, you know, if you haven't had a much training in this, you know, it's, it's the, the concept of having your, the, your residents preparing in advance to learn the material by getting key understanding uh, about the topic as they pre-read. And then you use case-based teaching where there's a lot of interaction, Q&A, uh, problem solving done in the session. And then you reinforce that learning with pre and post testing. And if you do these active learning methods, you can you can dramatically enhance both comprehension of the key material, but also retention of it in the long term. And you know because in, if our residents don't foster this long term retention uh, of the content that they're learning, they're going to be getting barraged with a lot of information. But if they can't retain it and use it later, it doesn't do them much good. So how we teach it is is critically important. It's it's, it's as important as the content that we're teaching, so that they can actually retain the content that they learn. So I'm Natasha, I'm gonna take over here. I wanted to give some helpful hints on how to use this. I will say that the RCR has helped me a ton. Um, one of the things you're gonna find is that the 
the PowerPoint presentations are all editable, so you can use the portions you want. You can use it right out of the box, or you can tweak it for the way you want to use it. And um, if you're if you're all interested, I'm going to go into a live demonstration about how to how to use this resource here. So can everyone see my screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, perfect. So I've actually got us here on the allergic rhinitis, but if you want, when you log in, you're going to first access your curriculum. And when you access the curriculum, you can see here, we've got all these topics, adolescent health, allergy. If you're not sure where to find it, you can always do a search as well. Um, and here I'm going to click on allergy. You can see it has a check. That means it actually has a curriculum with it. Um, and sometimes these actually have more than one curriculum, depending on how broad the topic is. For example, here under allergy, we've got allergic rhinitis and we've got PFTs. So now what you're going to do, you, you click on the allergic rhinitis to, act, to activate the curriculum. And, and here's what you can see that you have. You've got, you've got the recommended readings, and there are quite a few on here. And this one, um, ironically, I just updated last week. I'm one of the ones who updates the readings. And when you click on this, it takes you straight to an article at the um, AAFP, for example. So if I use this practice parameters, it goes straight to the AAFP.org to the article that um, we would like the residents to read. You can download the article. Um, I like to email some of these to the residents and say, hey, I want you guys to read this ahead of time. Um, and you can see here, if you have full access to this, and we chose the AFP because number one, it's it's excellent, but also I would have, most of you will have access to this. We're trying to avoid recommending readings that are additional subscriptions or anything like that. We want these to be open access. Um, we try not to have them to be too long. We want the residents to be able to read these. These are like anywhere from three to five page articles. So now after you, these are the, again, the pre-work for the residents. And here's actually the curriculum. And you can see you've got the PowerPoint here, the facilitator's guide, the quiz, and a Jeopardy case. Um, and then we also have feedback on the curriculum. So if you really like it, you can give it, you can give it several stars. This is, this is a great curriculum on allergic rhinitis. So when I start looking at a curriculum that I want to use for my didactics, the first thing I do is I click on this facilitator's guide and I download it. So when you click on this, it's going to download. I've already done that to save you some time. So here is my, um, my, my allergic rhinitis guide. And you can see here all these open under protected view, but you just click enable editing and then you have access to, you can edit it as much as you would like. And these are all based on very similar um, formats. You have your learning objectives and your key learning points, but this one's very, what's, what I find very helpful about reading these guidelines first is it lets me know how that PowerPoint is structured. This one, for example, is you want to open it and click through look at it before you actually present because it's got a jeopardy style game involved and it explains how you're going to set up this teaching for example you're going to set it up with two teams of residents and then there's a presenter who's a scorekeeper and how you set up this curriculum for the for the presentation when when you scroll down you'll have the pre-test and the post-test and you'll have the answers again be careful you don't want to give the wrong the wrong test to the residents and hand them the test with the answers and you you have here is you actually also have um, for this one we have a, a, a final jeopardy patient case this is like a worksheet so for this curriculum you're instructed to print this out so your residents have access have have this when they're working on their final jeopardy and then the last part which is the, the most awesome is this is the powerpoint um, what's nice about these is they're a completely out of the box curriculum that you can use but let's say you don't want to, you can pick and choose which slides you want to use. You can make this completely editable. The only request we have is that you do credit the re residency curriculum resource. And here's a wonderful um, example of some active learning. When you run this presentation, for example, this is one where we set it up for gaming. And you go through the slides and here is a really nice Jeopardy slide. And it explains to you in that, that presentation on how to do this. So like if a resident picks this one, it takes you to the slide, like what's allergic rhinitis and your resident teams are fighting to give you the right answer with a click it goes here and you're, you're, here's time for you to review and then you have another section of how to go back. So this is a really nice way of doing live teaching, active teaching um, that's already out of the box for you, but you can again use it as you want. Um, so I think, do I have anything else I need to demonstrate real quick? Um, but that's the really nice versions of this. Again, it's completely out of the box. You can use it as a full curriculum or you can pick and choose which aspects you want to use. Start with your facilitator's guide first. 
All right, Emily, back to you. Do I need to click anything or can you take over? I'll take over. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. all righty. Um, so I'll take back over and I'm gonna go back into slideshow. All right, so we wanted to do a little bit of audience discussion here. Um, you all should see the option to, there's kind of like a little question mark on your screen. That's a chat box option. So what you'll have the opportunity to do is to type in um, some answers to this. We wanted to know how are your didactic sessions currently structured, weekly, daily, etc. We wanted to get kind of an idea of how you do that because we're about to launch into some discussion of some ways that you could incorporate um, this um, residency curriculum resource into that. So if you want to go ahead and start typing, what I will do, since you're writing in your answers, um, I will share those with our panelists. All right, so we've got um, we've got a vote for daily. Um, we've got a couple people who say that they're doing, a lot of people are saying weekly. Um, that's definitely a popular answer that I'm seeing coming in. Somebody says once weekly for three and a half hours. Um, someone else says we have didactics weekly on Tuesday afternoons from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, someone else says weekly for a four-hour period. And then someone else says weekly group didactics and then daily, almost daily, noon conferences. Weekly, also on rounds and to be determined, says someone else. So they're still kind of figuring that out. Um, yeah, looks like weekly is the most common, but kind of with some variations within that. Um, so quite a bit of variety there. Um, someone else says we have white weekly didactics on Wednesday morning before clinic. So thanks for sharing your um, kind of your own particular situation, everyone. And feel free to go ahead and submit any other questions that you have kind of as we proceed. We've got a fair bit more content to cover, but we'll also have um, a fair amount of time for Q&A at the end of this. We're kind of speeding through a lot of this content to make sure we have plenty of time to answer lots of questions at the end. So you can definitely submit your questions and we'll make sure we get to them later on as well. All right, um, so if we wanna keep going. All right, go back over to me. All right, so is, is my audio working better on the phone than yeah, on? Yes, much clearer, thanks Tim. Okay, per perfect, perfect. Sorry about the audio difficulties earlier. So uh, this next section, uh, what I'd like to do is we would like to share a little bit about some potential models uh, for integrating uh, family medicine curriculum resource into your own curriculum. Uh, everybody has, uh, you know, the kind of their own structures, but uh, I'd like to be able to give a little bit, give some examples of different ways that you can utilize this resource. So the residency curriculum resource, it's uh, very flexible. Um, as uh, Natasha said, uh, it's editable. You can change the length, the, the size, the type of, of presentation, and it can be used in a number of different ways to augment uh, the education of your residents. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're gonna go over a, a few different models of integration. So it can be utilized as an 18 month curriculum that will cover that whole breadth of family medicine core content that we discussed earlier. Uh, it could, as, as somebody, one of the respondents actually said, uh, be used as a component of the inpatient service rotation uh, where you can actually use it on rounds. Uh, it can be used on other rotations. And then a couple of other uh, areas would be using it with resident presentations or for resident self study. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is using it as part of the 18-month didactic curriculum. So the RCR can actually uh, enhance the structure of your didactic sessions, uh, utilizing some evidence-based content, uh, some peer-reviewed content, <coughs> to be able to integrate into the uh, remainder of your didactic structure. Uh, those, the organization that Mike talked about a little bit earlier with those larger groupings where you could, uh, could look at the, the larger uh, topics where the core topics actually fall under can help you uh, kind of use that in a way that can uh, enhance the fabric of the program as you're building, uh, building out your 18-month curriculum. And the areas, it allows you to also kind of emphasize some of those content areas that are most heavily emphasized on the ABFM certification exam. We know that there are certain areas that, that are more heavily covered, and they're also very heavily represented within uh, the curriculum resource as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the nice part about these as part of the, the curriculum is they allow for some enhanced interaction between the residents and the faculty, as, as Mike uh, and uh, Natasha had talked about. Um, 
because of some of the pre-readings, the testing, the case studies, um, the, the, the formats such as like the Jeopardy formats and, and some of the other case studies, allow for a joint interaction between uh, the, the residents and faculties as they both explore this topic, uh, the topics. Um, and then also allowing these modules to be uh, at your fingertips uh, it helps you to actually prepare in the event that there were any issues with unforeseen circumstances like somebody actually canceled the last minute or you have some found time in the schedule where uh, instead of having a, a, a blank spot you could actually pull in at, in very short notice um, one of these one of these sessions to be able to enhance the curriculum uh, next slide please so we're going to go through a few of the different potential didactic module uh, mo models uh, at this point. So next slide. So this is an example of a once weekly didactic block, and this is, sounded like it was one of the more popular types of models uh, from from our respondents. And this is actually at my program what we actually do as well. So. Uh, this is an example of what a schedule could look like for a once weekly didactic um, on, a, on, a, on a Wednesday in this particular example. Um, so you could potentially take the topics and spread them out so that week one, week two, week three, week four of the block each uh, had um, a different um, emphasis. So in this example, uh, adult medicine week one, uh, pediatric medicine week two, uh, OBGYN or women's health week three, and then behavioral week four. And you could do one or two um, sessions um, as, as would be uh, able to fit into your schedule to be able to cover, uh, cover those topics on a routine basis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and it allows for multiple hours on a single day to be uh, devoted to the, to the formal education. And you can spread those core topics out throughout the schedule. Next slide, please. So uh, building an 18-month cycle, uh, you could, uh, by, by having all of the modules available uh, with actually, a, there's actually a spreadsheet included with RCR where you can look at what content has actually been covered. You could actually march that out in a way that within 18 months you could cover all the core topics that were necessary for your residence education in family medicine. And typically, if you scheduled just two a week, like we talked about, or eight a month, uh, each week you would get around two to three hours of dedicated uh, time um, that, that was dedicated to those didactic topics, with most of, the, most of the sessions being about an hour in length for the facilitator's guide, but some of them being slightly longer if they're a workshop or have some other interactive components. Uh, next slide. Uh, some people actually did say that they actually also had daily uh, didactics, uh, either like at a morning report or a noon conference. So, um, like I said, most of the most of the modules are at this point are in about an hour, uh, an hour in length, 45 minutes to an hour in length. But many of them can be actually divided down to smaller segments, so they could be done instead in 20 to 30 minutes, or part of it could be done in 20 to 30 minutes if you had a shorter segment of time that that uh, you had to be able to dedicate to uh, to instruction. So um, sometimes morning report or noon lectures would only accommodate 40, 45 minutes, uh, but you can edit the edit some of those sessions down to be able to fit that fit those um, those uh, spaces. Um, in this particular example, uh, since you were meeting every day um, for didactics, you could potentially rotate the topics and do um, uh, like adult medicine twice a week, do pediatric medicine once a week, OBGYN once a week, and then uh, behavioral medicine uh, once a week. Uh, and again, this is just an example of a potential schedule. Uh, next slide, please. Um, like I said, one, it'd be one hour or less sessions held on a daily basis. Next uh, slide, please. Um, and you can also look at those uh, areas even in this session, in this uh, format, just like doing it on the once weekly. Again, you can match that up to the ABFM examination uh, breakdown as well to make sure that you're appropriately emphasizing uh, the, the more heavily represented topics. And really, either your faculty or your residents could lead those those sessions, depending upon uh, what you do within your program. Next slide, please. Uh, some people said that they actually used it as part of the inpatient service rotation. And uh, like uh, I, I mentioned, uh, many of these modules can be divided down into shorter sections, either just pulling out the case studies themselves or some of the shorter uh, components of those, of those presentations in a way that they could easily fit into an inpatient rounding schedule. 
another thing that Mike referenced a little bit earlier that we are uh, in the development of right now is something that we call just-in-time teaching, which are going to be much shorter modules that are specifically designed to, to, uh, to highlight an aspect of one of the core topics and is able to be fit into a smaller space, uh, such as on, on rounds or in precepting. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, one example with the inpatient service would be kind of after rounds, the attending physician or senior resident could do a small group uh, discussion utilizing the residency curriculum resource um, material. Again, all, virtually all of these sessions actually have some case-based um, sessions. That's something that we look at as editors when we are approving content and reviewing content to make sure that there's that level of interactivity um, to be able to facilitate uh, the, the learning and retention. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so we can actually approach some of the uh, inpatient uh, rotation education in a couple of ways. Uh, one would be uh, looking at what showed up on uh, on service on a given week. So let's say you had a pancreatitis case or something else along those lines. Um, you could pull the RCR content from that particular case and utilize it for small group discussion. Or you could also identify uh, some core topics, like four to eight topics that are going to be primarily utilized on inpatient service only and make sure that uh, the residents who are rotating through, when they rotate through their inpatient service, that they will actually get those topics. So next slide, please. So here's an exam, uh, example schedule for that. So uh, in a four-week block, uh, one week uh, you might do ACS, the next week you might do respiratory failure, next week pancreatitis, next week DVT and PE. And those may be either things that you happen to encounter in those weeks or those may be part of the set curriculum uh, that, that you want to cover during uh, each inpatient uh, rounding month. Uh, next slide. Uh, and another another uh, thing that you can actually do with RCR that, that we utilize it for is as part of other rotations. So um, the format of many of the sessions are set up in such a way that they could be utilized for self-study. So you could assign some key modules for residents who are, say, uh, rotating on, say, dermatology or on allergy and immunology, et cetera, to be able to utilize those modules for self-review, self-study, and self-testing. Um, to allow, make sure that they have adequate exposure to the, uh, the appropriate learning points. Uh, next slide, please. And then the pre and post tests um, on those other rotations can actually help to emphasize those key learning points and also serve uh, to, to give some feedback to um, their advisors or the faculty that they actually had uh, learned what we want to, wanted them to learn from those particular sessions. Next slide. And now we'll turn it over to another poll. So we wanted to go ahead and ask you all, um, if you are currently using the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource, have you encountered any difficulties in getting faculty buy-in um, to get everyone on board with using the curriculum, since it's a little bit of a different format than you might have been previously familiar with? So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll so that you can all can start voting on whether or not you've um, had any problems with getting everyone on board and using this curriculum. Um, so we're getting some people voting um, for those of you who are using the resource. I'll give it just a second here while you kind of get your votes in from about faculty buy-in for using this resource. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second here. Ooh, this is very interesting. We've got, um, I think most of the people who have voted who had said that they were using it because we had about 30% or so um, who we're currently using it, and uh, we're kind of neck and neck. Um, it looks like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and share, I'll close the poll, and I'll share the results. So um, we were perfectly even at 50%, but 58% um, say that they did not have any problems, but, um, well, not much. And then 42% uh, say that they did have some problems with getting faculty to buy in and um, you know, use the, the resource, which is you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to um, have this presentation is to give tips and ideas of how to use it. So I'll go ahead and um, hide the results of the poll and we'll um, carry on with the presentation.
Great, that would be me again. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So introducing your faculty to um, the RCR, if you do have it or when you do choose to use it. Um, I will tell you what did not work for my program. I was so excited that we were able to get access to the RCR and we had a brief faculty meeting. I told people what the password is and was like, here it is, go and use it. And about six months later, I found that absolutely no one used it except me. So that was a, a crash and burn. It sounded like faculty would use it and they, they didn't. And part of it was our faculty were used to a routine. This is how we do didactics. This is, and going onto a website and sometimes just exploring it in busy, in busy faculty lives, it's easier to go back to a habit than to look at something new. Um, what my faculty did start learning is when they started using it, they were like, wow, now now when they didn't have access for a day, I suddenly got texts of get me access, get me back. So um, it, it may take a while. Um, and if, if we just expect them to do it on their own, they, they may not do it. So um, getting the faculty um, used to using it and knowing how to use it can really help their buy in. So next slide. So it's really useful to actually review some of the material with the faculty, just to have them understand the concept and how it can work within your, your, your program. For example, those four hour didactics like Tim was talking about, or the hour didactics. And one of the things that helped is when I actually met with some of the faculty and showed them, walk them through how to do this and like, okay, let's log you on. Let's make sure the log on works. It turns out some of them had the wrong password, making sure like, this is how you download it. This is how these things work. And suddenly people started slowly using it and realizing, hey, it's totally fine to use someone else's presentation. In fact, that's what it's designed for. And it's also totally fine to use parts of it, um, especially the more um, for, for faculty when you're assigned a topic, for example, that you don't like. For those of you who are in a four hour didactic session, I'm sure you've all had that situation where you're like, oh, please don't pick me, please don't pick me. And then you get the one topic that you just really don't want. And then it's so nice to be able to come here and, and use these pre-made curricula. And that's definitely where um, our faculty got very in, involved. And it was, a, it was a nice point. It was like, oh, this is wonderful. I don't have to spend hours on a topic that I really don't like to do. Um, next slide, please. So here is one of my absolute favorite parts of um, getting faculty buy-in and using the RCR, is this can be used to help you contribute to education of residents on a national level. And the key to this is this can help you get scholarship credit. Um, I remember um, submitting an article to one of our family medicine journals and getting rejected like twice. And I was just tiny, it did nothing for my confidence. And in my head, I kept thinking scholarly activity is only a publication in a journal. And that's not, it's, it's a publication and it's spreading the, the knowledge that you've had in, in a peer reviewed resource and this is just wonderful that you can do this contribute to the curriculum build a curriculum adopt a curriculum and have this count towards scholarship credit and you can even team up with residents so this is actually a wonderful opportunity and one of the things i i really like about this um next up so the key is again remember it's worth spending about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes on a faculty meeting to introduce your faculty to this for, you know, have one or two people get used to using it and then showing showing the other group how to use it, um, especially for, you know, your longer didactics. Other benefits are suddenly one of your presenters cancels. You've got a great resource here for curriculum out of the box. And when faculty are used to using it and knowing how to, how to implement it, that can be incredibly helpful in those um, having to come up with something very quickly. And, then you'll find that people really do do like using it and they become very used to it and, and it's very helpful. All right, Tim, uh, actually, I think Mike, it's up to you. It's going to you. Okay, so I, I just wanted to touch base on a couple of things too about this is that, you know, one of the things that we had to do with our faculty um, actually before the RCR was available was really do some training in how to do case-based learning, case-based teaching, and also active learning uh, techniques. And one of the things that uh, Tim referenced was that you know a lot of times faculty want to fall back on what they're used to and they want to use their old presentations. And the problem is is that many of those teaching styles are based on the medical school teaching style we were we were all exposed to 45 slides over an hour, and uh, you know people just zone out. They just don't learn from that. 
And uh, you know, we don't need to waste our residents' time using the old methodologies of teaching. And we really hope, are hoping that by having a curriculum that kind of forces faculty to do case-based teaching and active learning uh, methods, that that becomes the norm across all of our uh, programs because that's what really helps retention and learning is to have that kind of engagement. And then, so if, if you haven't had a chance uh, as a faculty group to have any kind of uh, faculty development on active learning methods, I would recommend one uh, book to you to start out with called The Brain Rules by John Medina. And John has been doing work across many educational systems around how the brain learns and how we as human beings can put things into long-term storage and retention and use and to learn about conceptual learning. And so he, his book is excellent and I would recommend that it ought to be required reading for faculty, I think any, across you know, anywhere in the country because it helps us understand how it is we should be teaching. And you'll see, you know, you'll see the, the kind of how this is woven into much of the curriculum that we have because we're, we're asking our authors and we're critiquing our authors for, who do uh, create these sessions to go back and, and really look, use these brain rules to help people learn the content that they're, they're being exposed to. Next slide. So just to conclude, you know, the Family Medicine Resource really is an incredible uh, tool to augment your residence education. I mean, your faculty still need to do the teaching, but this provides them with a resource to really build on uh, active learning methods and not have to do all the groundwork of building a presentation from, from the very, you know, from the very bottom up. It also does provide also a resource for them to actually get engaged at the national level. And I, I like Natasha's comment too about one of the things about having a paper published is that you publish a paper in a journal and you know maybe a couple hundred people read it, maybe only 50 people ever read the whole thing. Uh, when you have a presentation on the RCR, you're exposing that to all the subscribers of the RCR, which is at this point, I think about 180 programs. And you know they're gonna use that. It's gonna be something that's gonna be, you know, influence resident learning for, for quite some time. And so it gives you a chance to really contribute to the, the, the scholarship of family medicine. Next slide. So just, you know, if you're, if you're creative in how you use this, uh, if you engage your faculty, if you really get them um, aware of the tools that they have available and, and really push them to use that tool, you can have a, a deep impact on your resident learning and make your faculty lives a lot easier without having to create the wheel at every single program or across the country, which was really one of our goals, was to make, make this tool a tool that would actually enhance learning across the board. So I think we can go on to other questions. All right. So um, for those of you, this is this is your moment. This is um, if you want to go ahead and turn in any questions that you have. I know a few of you had written in questions kind of while we were discussing. I'll try to see um, kind of where they would have come in. I think somebody had asked, oh, I'll, you know, even while we were doing some of the polls, like someone said that um, he said, that they said that they weren't sure if they'd had any problems with faculty buy-in for the for the program, but that their um, program just started using this resource this last week. So probably not sure, um, yes or no yet. Um, one, yeah. Oh, oh, this person, they actually let, let me know that they had just started at the job. So they themselves had just started and wasn't, wasn't positive yet. Um, he also is asking, is there a behavioral health module? Um, can the panelists speak to that? Yes. Yeah, we have, we have, we have multiple sessions on uh, behavioral health topics and under yep. the core topic areas. And we've got, um, we've got curriculums under anxiety, um, communication skills, delirium, dementia, um, delirium session, domestic violence, eating disorders. Mood disorder. Grief management. Yep. Sleep disorders. Mood. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so one yeah. thing I did I did want to bring up for the group that um, I just forgot to mention is so this curriculum when you're an author we do ask every three years that you review your curriculum and see if there's any updates um, because we do want it, we we know family medicine is incredibly broad and there's always something new coming and that really helps us keep the curriculum up to date. Great. And we also, so we that also, was actually, 
Yeah, we also tap authors too. When there's a new guideline that comes out, like when the hypertension guidelines came out a couple of years ago, we reached out to the author and said, hey, can you update your slides to, to, to deal with this new guideline change? And that happened within a few weeks. So when there's a major change in the particular topic area, we do ask the authors to go in and update that so it matches the, the current recommendations. Mm -hmm. One thing, we, all of you are incredibly helpful with that because mm -hmm. with it being so broad, there's a click, there's a link on all of these curriculum where you can click and give us feedback. And again, yeah. the broadness of fat family medicine is we welcome your feedback where it's like, hey, there's a new guideline for this topic. Um, it's so helpful. We try to respond to those pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that you're speaking to that because we did have somebody who had submitted a question asking about when was the module last updated right before you started speaking to that. And then they did mention that they, they felt like the asthma module was a bit out of date. And I was actually going to say like that's what that feedback um, button is for is to, to let you all know. Mm -hmm. um you know if there's if there's something that you feel like could be updated or tweaked um yeah. oh, we've got the procedure in place but also that that's the other mechanism for that as well and one thing too is occasionally we have curriculums that are what we call adoptable where the original author isn't able to update them so we certainly are always looking for people to adopt a curriculum like adopting a pet and then you can either you will get scholarly credit you can build on the curriculum that's there you can totally revamp that curriculum um, so it's 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 also a good opportunity. And again, thank you for the feedback. Please keep giving us the feedback. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I have um, one of the one of our listeners asks, how long in your experience does it take to prep for these lecture lectures, i.e., review the faculty guide and content prior to giving the lecture? Yeah, you know, for for my I can speak at least for myself and for my faculty. Usually, usually uh, probably twenty to thirty minutes uh, on a lot of the topics is is, is adequate. They want to the things you want to make sure you've done is actually that you've been through all the slides and that you know the content uh, that you've done the pre readings that you are you've done the quizzes or at least gone through the quizzes so that you have a good idea of not only what the right answer is but why it's correct because there's going to be discussion there and that you've looked through the case studies. Um, so I'd say on the, on, the, uh, on the high side, probably up to an hour, but probably closer to, closer to 30 minutes for most of them for my faculty. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question. I think it's a little bit related to subscriptions. It says, can family medicine programs from outside the U.S. who are members of SDFM use this resource? Um, Yes. Yeah. Any, any, anybody can subscribe, actually, but as long as you're a member of STFM or AFMRD. Mm -hmm. But it is a subscription-based resource. Yeah. Um. And for those of you out of the country, again, this is Natasha. I'm originally from Germany. If there are guidelines, for example, where Europe is slightly different than the United States, definitely let us know because we're more than happy to, to link or make a comment about those as well. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, we have a question um, related to, it says, during our didactics, we have regular weekly lectures given by the residents. Can the residents use the RCR for these lectures, for their lectures? They, they can. That, yeah. And, and a lot of that comes down to a, an individual program decision as to who you share the passwords with. Um, you know, with, within, uh, within our program, we do let our residents have access to RCR because uh, we would like them to include the same types of evidence-based content in, in their sessions as well uh, and have the same, the same uh, resources that our faculty do. The reason you see us all laughing is that was a section in the PowerPoint that we actually cut so we could have more time for questions about how residents could potentially use it. Um, definitely giving them access. One thing is some, some programs want the residents to do a few of these on their own so they can get practice with it. Um, but definitely we've had residents who find it very helpful. We have a couple of questions by, um, by one of our um, participants who are kind of like specific uh, module questions. Like, uh, do you have a module on billing and or quality improvement? And then um, that person also wants to know, are there efforts to build a faculty development curriculum? 
There are actually two billing and coding uh, workshops actually included on on the on the uh, uh, in the curriculum, which are really uh, quite detailed. Um, so those those I've actually used both of those with our residents here, and they were very very well received. As far as faculty development, probably not specifically within RCR. There are other there are other uh, tools available through STFM for faculty development more specifically that are probably target this. This is really more of an educational resource uh, for uh, for uh, the, the education of, of our residents with uh, family medicine topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we definitely want to keep this focused on RCR, but um, I will say that there are online certificate programs that you might consider checking out through STFM, like the Residency Faculty Fundamentals um, Certificate Program and the Medical School Faculty Fundamentals Certificate Program are both online resources that are full curriculums um, for early career, early to mid-career faculty. So definitely take a look at our, at the STFM resources that way. Um, and that billing, that billing module is a wonderful example of a a lecture you may be assigned to where you're like, oh, I don't want to build it. I don't want to build it. Don't pick me. And then it's so nice to have that one available. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I'm trying to see if we've got any other questions I may have missed in here. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience right now? It looks like kind of like the first burst of questions has kind of trickled off a little bit. Um, or whether there's anything else that you, the presenters, wanted to address? And I would just say that we have a number of topics that are still outstanding, not very many actually that are left, but we have uh, topics that in, in pediatrics and uh, several other, er you know, several other topics kind of spattered around different areas of family medicine that we are still looking for authors for. So if you're a program director and you have faculty who need to do scholarly work, this would be a great place to you know, look, at, look at what's available under the, under the, the uh, request or the submission part of the RCR page, which you can access without a subscription and see what topics are open. And that, you know, try to, if you have a faculty member who's already doing lectures in that area, it'd be great to have them, you know, beef that lecture up and submit it for review. And then we could give them feedback and they can have a really high quality presentation that you can have for your own program, but then also share it across the country. So we would encourage you to find more authors so we can finish out these last remaining topics that we have left. And, and also kind of along the same same lines, uh, if you are going through the curriculum and you see that there is something that perhaps you have a session on that is not something that we've included in RCR to, to date that you feel would augment the, augment the topics, please feel free to reach out to us, even though there wouldn't be a direct submission uh, process for that. Um, the editors would be happy to talk to you to see if it would be something that would be uh, appropriate for inclusion um, and, and, uh, and we can figure out a workaround on it. Great. Well, we haven't received any other additional questions coming in, so I think it sounds like we've kind of covered the majority of the questions that had come in about kind of how to implement it or what the um, content of that would be. Um, so I did want to just kind of let you all know that we um, have recorded this session, and so we will be making that available. Um, both we will be emailing out a recording of this to all of you who have attended as well as to those of you who had registered, and that we'll also be making um, this available on the um, Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource website. Um, so um, talking about faculty buy-in, um, you can definitely share this with um, other faculty at your program if you would like to kind of give them um, quick tips on how to use this. Um, so definitely make um, take advantage of that. I want to thank um, all of our panelists, the editors of this um, of this resource, for making time for this today um, for this really informative presentation. And um, thank you all for joining us on on, on your Friday, um, this beautiful September day. So, um, anything else to add? So, Emily, I was just curious if we wanted to ask the audience: Are are there any kind of seminars or anything else you would like to see us do, like another one of these sessions, particular? in helping you use the RCR or helping you submit to the RCR or something like that, like top, top tips for a presentation or, you know, what does the audience feel might be helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. We'll uh, give them a chance to kind of maybe think on it and submit their questions here. 
on if there's any other like webinars or sessions like this that would be really helpful on details. Um, okay, somebody suggests top tips for a presentation, maybe um, demonstrating a session. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else suggested you're going to talk about the just-in-time sessions. Maybe I missed it, she says. Yeah, we could we could just jump in that real quick. So the just in, just in time sessions are actually a, like a single case presentation on a core topic. That's you know just a single case as a narrow presentation with a few with really a focus on management of the patient. And these are the typical presentations we do often on rounds or you know especially in patient unit or maybe on OB where you you have a problem and then you work through how how do you how do you manage this patient in the, with this diagnosis. And so those are short presentations, maybe five slides at the most, uh, maybe no slides, maybe just a handout or a worksheet with a case printed on it. But we're looking for something you can teach in 10 to 15 minutes. And so that is another set of topics that we are open to uh, receiving, and they can be on any core topic that's already out there. And we do, and if that would also go through a peer review process, but you know, once accepted, it would be added on to a, a core topic as a just-in-time presentation. So that's, it's, it's in process right now. I don't, do we have any of them live yet? Do you know? Or we, we're in the process of reviewing them, right? Yeah, I mean, we have some samples that uh, mm, Tim has right. put together, but I don't think we have anything posted yet. But it's coming. Yep. And that's a great example of something for residents, for example, you know, what do you do when the nurse calls you with this complaint? And that's how you can open up a case and then develop that five, that brief five slide scenario. Okay, great. Okay. Great. That's all we have um, coming in right now from the audience as far as suggestions. So it sounds like perhaps in the future we could do top tips for actually how to um, get into the nitty gritty of how to give a presentation using our, a specific RCR um, resource. Um, so that might be something for the future. Okay. Thank you, Thank so you everybody. Well, thanks again, everyone. And we will be sending out the, um, the resource soon, so the, the recording soon. So have a great day.